prepare webinar, Fostering Expressions of Lament and Bearing Witness with Those Experiencing Moral Injury. I'm Nancy Ramsey, the director of the Soul Repair Center at Bright Divinity School on the campus of TCU in Fort Worth, Texas. The center seeks to provide resources for religious leaders and professional caregivers who support veterans and their families affected by moral injury. Our mission includes offering free monthly webinars that further the mission with a focus on topics that have been inadequately covered or not yet addressed. We are grateful for the support of the Shea Center on Moral Injury at Volunteers of America, which co-sponsors these webinars. I want to remind you that all our webinars are posted as links on this site and at the VOA YouTube channel. Ordinarily, the link is available within 10 days. In the case of today, you'll also find there will be references cited by the presenters. Today, our webinar will be moderated by Rabbi Kim Geringer, who serves on the pastoral care faculty at Hebrew Union College in New York City. Kim also holds a master's in social work. She's a member of the National Advisory Board of the Soul Repair Center and has published and taught courses addressing military moral injury. In early June, she and her colleague, Nancy Weiner, will lead a virtual national conference on moral injury sponsored by Hebrew Union College. You'll find information about that on the Soul Repair Center site and at Hebrew Union. Our chat monitor is Kyle Fauntleroy, a development officer at Bright and a retired captain in the US Navy Chaplain Corps. Kyle is a founding member of the National Advisory Board. We're also grateful to Sam McAllister at VOA, who's managing this production. Today, our webinar will have a more informal format with each of the three presenters making initial remarks, and then the three of us will engage in conversation. Our moderator will join us and then bring questions that you post. We'll prioritize your questions sent to Kyle Fauntleroy. Please also note that our next webinar is scheduled for May 25th and will feature attention to fostering experiences of forgiveness featuring Professor Shelley Rambo, the Reverend Dr. Michael Yandel, and Chaplain Chris Hansen. I now turn this over to our moderator, Kim Geringer, who will introduce the panelists and share a few more remarks. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here today. Um, <clears throat> let me introduce uh, our teachers for today. Uh, first, uh, Chaplain Christopher Hansen, Lieutenant in the U.S. Navy. Um, Chaplain Hansen has served with the Marine Infantry and Naval Special Warfare, deploying to combat zones in the Middle East and conducting training exercises in Australia. And he currently teaches moral injury and chaplaincy at Western Theological Seminary. Uh, next, uh, Dr. Kathleen O'Connor. Uh, who is the William Marcellus McFeeters Professor of Old Testament Emerita at Columbia Theological Seminary in Decatur, Georgia. And uh, Dr. Nancy Ramsey, as she said, the Director of the Soul Repair Center and Emerita Professor at Bright Divinity School. Um, and uh, as Nancy said, we will begin with um, uh, about a 10 minute uh, each presentation by each of our teachers. And then we will go into a conversation which eventually um, will include our audience. So uh, as we go through, um, if questions or comments uh, occur to you, please put them in the chat um, and we will um, in that way be able to bring you into the conversation as well. Okay, um, let me turn this over to uh, Chaplain Hansen. Good morning, everyone. I wanted to start my remarks today by framing it with a story of a Marine and his wife that I met about two years ago when serving with the infantry in 29 Palms. Now I had just gotten to 29 Palms and the unit I was being attached to was already deployed to the Middle East. But there was about 50 or so people left behind, medical issues, and then of course all the spouses and family members. Well, one of the spouses reaches out to me, a really nice young woman in her uh, young 20s, she has two children, I think one was three and one was only one year old at the time. And she starts saying that her husband, who this is his second deployment, has just kind of stopped calling home, which is not uncommon for people while deployed, but she said it was uncommon for him. And then she said, he seems more distant and then he's just kind of mean and he's never been mean to me. So 
we're kind of counseling and talking more and meeting with her. And as I'm asking her more questions, what's going on, she specifically says that he's been distancing himself. He keeps talking about how the family would be better off without me. He's talking about how maybe we should just get a divorce, how she should marry someone better, find someone better. And as she's going through this again and again, you see these themes of distance, separation, and how she and the children would be better off without him. Now, this was shocking to, um, to her because she's like, I, um, this was shocking to her because she said that um, he has never been like this before. He's never before pushed them away. He's always been very loving. He's always been the person to, and please excuse the mask. I just got told I have to now put it on here. Uh, that he had always been very respectful and she was so confused what's going on. So I start reaching out and there was some rumors going around that maybe something happened in Syria. He was in Syria at the time and that maybe something happened that they were involved in something that wasn't quite morally right, but we never got any details. Fast forward a little bit. Um, he comes home, he agrees to meet. It's very rocky. He keeps talking about divorce and how they'd be better off without him. And then once we get to this point, he does a few individual counselings with me and he just really feels guilty about something. He doesn't say the details, but there's something happened over there that he just didn't want to talk about, that he was a part of, that he did, that his unit did, and that his family would still be better without them. His wife is just flabbergasted by this because she says, of course, I mean better with you. I don't know what happened. I don't really care. Well, this had been going on for a couple months after they got back, and I felt like we weren't making a lot of progress with the guilt and shame that he apparently had but didn't want to talk about until I started to encourage him. You know, if you don't really want to talk to me and you don't want to talk to your wife, what if you just wrote something or prayed something? And I started to bring in like the Psalms or Lamentations or something with grief. And what if you started to use that as your expression outward? If you're not going to talk to me, maybe you'll just talk to God or a higher power or maybe just to some writing. And of course, he was a bigger, tougher guy. And he's like, I don't know if I'm going to do that. I was like, no, no, just look, just try that. And I gave him a few different outlines that I'm sure um, we'll talk more about detail about different ideas someone can use. But after this, he comes back a few days later and he's like, all right, I'm willing to talk a little bit. And I was like, what changed? And he said, for the first time, I actually looked and kind of faced myself and thought about what I did and thought about what others did, and I'm ready to start talking about it. And it was his own personal experience of um, lament and grief that he finally was able to turn outward that allowed him to start doing this. Fast forward a little bit, shortly after that, he was able to tell just a little bit of his story to his wife who looked at him and said, yes, I know you did those types of things. I accept you for who you are. I just want my husband back and not someone telling me about divorce every other week. So what stood out to me was it was that moment when he started to do some type of lament, some type of poem, some type of writing, that all of a sudden his healing journey started. And then that healing journey was met with acceptance from his wife, acceptance from me as some type of a chaplain or moral authority because he looked up to chaplains and pastors. He specifically was religious. And that started his healing process. So it makes me think a little bit about David Wood, a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, when he wrote that in his experiences interviewing people with moral in injury, it was often the acceptance of a family member or acceptance of a wife that saved the people's lives. And then I said, all right, well, how do we even get to that point of acceptance? How does one even say that? But before I got there, I was thinking too about Michael Castagnana and our therapist at Camp Pendleton working with Marines who said that individual therapy wasn't always as effective as group therapy. Because in group therapy, someone could actually share their grief, share their trouble out loud, and then be accepted by the whole group. And I said, that's great. So if acceptance is the key to it, as we'll talk about in the next webinar, how do we even get to opening up and reaching back outward to be accepted by someone else? And that brought me over to some of the psychologists in post-traumatic growth and other trauma studies. And as many of us are familiar with, they have their own stages or phases of growth or of recovering from trauma. And I don't really like to 
try to pinpoint anyone to specific stages or phases because I think it is a little more circular where we all experience a lot of different things at different times together. However, um, if you look at someone like Marty Hauerwerts, professor of psychiatry at UCSF, David Feldman, professor of psychology at Santa Clara, or Stephen Joseph in the British uh, Psychological Society, in their phases and models, what they have together is about three different areas that people go through. The first is that they have to confront the reality they're in and honestly accept where they are. Now, they weren't specifically talking about moral injury per se, but as I looked through some of their case studies, a lot of them had a moral element and moral injury seemed to be a part of their trauma. The second phase for them was taking responsibility for future and desiring to move forward. And the third was setting realistic goals and working through. Now that first phase though, that they all seem to have in common was some type of confronting reality, honestly accepting help and reaching outward. And that's where I see this idea of lament and the bearing of uh, witness to be so powerful. So how do we even begin to reach outward? How do we even begin to tell our story with someone else when we're so turned inward? We know that with moral injury, people tend to turn inward. They don't wanna to talk to others. They don't wanna share their story. They feel tainted, they feel stained. So how do we get them to even begin to tell that story to someone else so they might be able to find acceptance? And for me, that's where I think that lament, ritual and bearing witness can be so helpful. That can be the first stage when someone is turned so far inward where they don't wanna necessarily talk to the spouse, but they might be able to write um, a psalm or a poem of lament, or they might even just be able to express themselves for the first time. Now, we think about lament, whether it's through writing, through reading, through crying out, to be a solo activity. But I actually think that it's quite relational in some ways. And what I mean by that is if moral injury is what turns us inward to ourselves, where we sever all ties and relationships with God, with others, with the supernatural, with family, with friends, once we start to enter into lament and ritual, we go from being so inward focused to now letting something out again. And that in itself can be, can be the beginning of rebuilding our relationships with others. And then from there, the idea of bearing witness. Bearing witness itself is the affirmation of someone's uh, situation that they're in, which is a relational connection. So sometimes just that ability to bear witness from their lament allows us to start to reconnect. And as we start to reconnect outward, that's when we start the healing process that some of the other psychologists and therapists say that we go through in our phases. So I think for this specific individual that I was um, talking to, this Marine, for him, he was kind of just stuck in that inward situation for months where he didn't want to tell his wife what he did. He kept pushing her away. He didn't really want to tell me what he did until he took that moment of lament and ritual all by himself, which allowed him to go from bearing it all inward to starting to express it back outward. And from there, he was able to um, feel some of the acceptance. We were able to work through more of you say different types of therapeutic models or rituals, but until that first lament, until that first moment of moving forward, we were kind of just stuck in that moral injury. I wanna leave us with those kind of opening remarks just to set the stage as I know um, Dr. Ramsey and O'Connor will be talking a lot more about the specifics of laments. I'm hoping in our conversations, we can dive into when and where to employ some of those different rituals and lamentations in order to help those as they move forward in their process of growth and healing. Great. Chris, thank you so much um, for that wonderful opening to our, uh, our learning together this afternoon. Thank you very much. Um, Kathleen O'Connor, please. Thank you, Kim. Um, I'm honored to be here. I never heard of moral injury when I was doing the work I was doing on the Book of Lamentations. And I begin by announcing that I am not a pastoral caregiver in any sense of the word. I'm an interpreter of text. But Chris's presentation seems to provide for me um, a process and a focus in relation to the biblical Book of Lamentations that may be a very important resource for people with moral injury, whether they believe in God, 
whether they're Jewish, Christian, or nothing, um, I think the text not only gives us content, it gives us form, and it gives us a process of movement toward the first stages of recovery, not the second stages where, at least in my, my thinking about the literature, in the second stages where it becomes necessary to represent, to re-narratize your life and put it in a bigger framework. This text doesn't do that. It does what Chris seems to be suggesting happened with his Marine. So I'll begin with, um, I'll try not to talk too fast and I'll try not to tell you every single thing I know. Um, but the Book of Lamentations is, uh, in the Hebrew Bible, it's five short poems. Hardly anybody pays attention to it. The Jewish community uses it for Tisha B'Av, the ninth of Av. The Christian community uses it occasionally in Holy Week because it's all about grief and loss and so on. The actual historical book probably, there's debate about this, but those people are wrong. The, the book comes from the fall of Jerusalem under the Babylonian invasions in the fifth, sixth century BCE, before the common era, before Christ. And it is a, an expression in poetry from the perspective of the victims, not the perpetrators. Still, um, it, it still is going to provide us with some of the clues that we need. Um, it is in lament form and in order in the biblical texts, either Psalms or here or elsewhere, to have a lament, you have to have complaints. You have to have discontent. You have to have fury and rage and you give it expression in a prayer form. And uh, that prayer implies confidence in a higher power. That prayer implies confidence in God, but this text uh, doesn't really underscore that terribly clearly. Okay, now I wanna say it's a book of poetry. There are five. There are, it's also a book of voices. And those voices are literary characters in the five poems. And those characters include the city of Zion personified as a woman, a narrator who talks to her and talks about her, a perhaps of most interest to military chaplains, a middle, a middle poem, chapter three, with a character who in Hebrew is called a geber. And that's a, a particular word for a male figure who is a protector of women and children. So in my writing, I call him the strong man. I also think he's a soldier. I think he's a captured soldier who's tortured, who experiences horrors. Um, and then he's the third voice. Then the fourth voice is the voice of the community that begins at the end of chapter three and goes to the end of the book. Now, um, what is the content of this? Well, it differs from voice to voice. And the reason that's important is that it's looking at suffering from multiple angles because there is no single angle on what's happened to this community of Israelites. There's no single angle that can, that can speak the unspeakable. And so my, my take on these poems is they're trying to give language to that which can't really be expressed. It's the way poetry works, a little hint here, a big hint there, something direct, then something indirect. So the content includes um, descriptions of trauma and abandonment. The city of Zion is abandoned. The Geber, the strong man in the middle is abandoned. The narrator is perplexed and overawed by what the suffering that the narrator sees involves. Um, there is a, an effort on the part of the narrator and on the part of the city to try to compare suffering to something else, but they can't find anything. The suffering is vaster than the sea. I, I find that am amazingly potent language to describe the circumstances of what my former student, uh, Brian Powers, calls full darkness in his book, Full Darkness, Original Sin, Moral Injury, and Wartime Violence. 
um, it's it's language where everything is bad, but nothing could be worse from the perspective of the speaker. Okay, so what the speakers are trying to do is speak um, about what is ungraspable. For example, the, the, the strong man, the soldier, talks about his teeth grinding on gravel. There's accusations in that women were committing cannibalism in the aftermath of these invasions. So there's this, I mean, if there's moral injury, that's where it is, especially in ancient Israel, that women would kill their children for food for other children, we assume. So we have this, this like unspeakable horror picture. But all of these voices, all four of the voices do one thing. They say what Chris wanted. They are looking for a witness. And the witness they want is God's own self. They call upon God to see and hear. See and hear. Oh, God. Even though they blame God, most of the speakers blame God for what they're experiencing. And at the same time, they call upon God to see it, to see the abject misery of the community and do something about it. Okay, so that's a really brief summary of some of the content and the efforts of the speakers to gain a witness. But here's another element of this poetry, which is fascinating to me. It is that these poems are acrostics and alphabetic poems, which means in Hebrew, um, they, they begin Aleph, Beit, Gimel, Daleth. Each line begins with a new letter of the alphabet. And that gets, that's very varied. Some of them are stronger. And the longest acrostic and the most intense is that of the strong man in the middle. But then in chapters four and five, it's as if the alphabet itself can't contain this anymore. And the, strong, the, the poems are considered alphabetic because there are 22 verses in each of them as there are 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet, consonant letters um, in the Hebrew alphabet. So um, I reflect on that form, since I think this is highly sophisticated poetry, I reflect on that form and think it's actually saying something to us. We try to contain the suffering in the alphabet and then even the alphabet begins to fall apart. You can't contain it A to Z. You try to give it order and shape, but ah, it doesn't quite make it. Okay, so in, um, in this highly sophisticated poetry, there is what I think is maybe most important about it, the missing voice, the missing voice, the one, the voice everyone, every speaker wants to hear in the book and that's the voice of God. Now, um, it, it certainly is bleak. It's bereft of comfort from God. And the text ends, oddly enough, with an appeal for God to restore the community. Unless you have forgotten us forever. Unless you have cast us off forever. So what does the missing voice do? Uh, of this is a biblical text. It's a sacred text to communities of faith. And yet the one word of comfort that is sought is not provided. And what I think the effect of the absence of divine voices, the effect of that is to leave present the voices of the suffering so that the witness they're looking for is actually the book itself, the book itself. Now I go into a long argument about what happens if you had a reply from God. And if you had a reply from God, it'll override everything. There'll be not another thing anybody notices. And um, Todd Linnefelt talks about that in his study of Lamentations, the way that history of interpretation always lands in the unsteady hope of the soldier, the strong man in the middle who is the one who says, um, your, uh, your mercies are new every morning. We have hymns to this. And the whole rest of the book gets ignored. So I say it's, it's a result of 
literary restraint that God says nothing. And so I see the whole book as a witness. And am I ready to stop? Yeah, one last thing. How, have I been talking for an hour and a half or only 10 minutes? No, 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 yeah, not, not yet. I wanted okay. to. Last point, last point. This book of poetry, these five poems, are a liturgy for the Jewish community. They are kept alive. These poems are, the poem, the book is kept alive throughout history. It becomes a Christian inheritance. And so it is this book that I claim is a witness to human suffering is now understood to be um, sung, recited, prayed, read in a community. So then the community is transformed into the witness Chris was looking for earlier. So there's a whole lot more to say, but I shall now be quiet and... Um, Say, Nancy, it's over to you. Um, thank you, thank Kathy. you Kathy. We'll, we'll continue to um, want much more when we get to the, the group conversation. Thank you so much. I, uh, I'm looking forward. I want to express my appreciation to my colleagues, Chris and Kathleen. I uh, speak as a pastoral theologian, that is, as someone who seeks the theological significance of experience and as a Protestant minister, and as the daughter of a World War II veteran who enlisted as a teenager to serve in the war, and eight decades later, as his defenses against showing emotional pain weakened, it was clear he was still grieving the losses of that war. War changes lives forever, precisely because it sears the souls of those who participate in its devastation and observe its consequences. Lamentation is an apt description of the emotional consequences of moral injury. We also know that in this nation, the predictable ways we engender boys to imagine themselves as strong and self-reliant often complicates their ability and share, to identify and share emotional pain. I hope future research might help us discern possible gender differences among veterans affected by moral injury. Unattended, moral injury also changes the lives of family and friends who walk beside veterans. They experience the qualified or limited emotional presence of those who are physically present, but psychologically absent. What psychologist Pauline Boss describes as ambiguous loss, what the wife in the story that Chris described was concerned about. Ambiguous loss is a kind of loss to which veterans who expect the world to be ordered justly and themselves to be strong and capable of responding effectively and ethically are especially vulnerable. Maintaining this self-image undermines resilience in the face of the brutal realities of war and that resilience becomes almost impossible. Lamentation, the soul searing expression of loss and grief is an anguished plea for the experience of being heard by a witness whose presence cuts through the dehumanizing isolation of severe suffering to validate the humanity of the one who suffers, precisely the voice that's missing as Kathleen described in Lamentation. Bearing witness to the humanity of the one who suffers can in fact be the turning point for restoring their hope and agency. I'll focus on how local religious leaders in many faith traditions can offer such a witness. I want to suggest strategies for religious leaders who have multiple opportunities to walk beside, to bear witness to veterans and their communities of faith. Such strategies may especially draw on the use of familiar ritual strategies in that tradition that help restore identity and belonging. And they may be ritual practices that the leaders and veterans shape together. That is, they construct them uh, reflecting on what their experience requires. Ritual responses to moral injury are recorded millennia ago. Moral injury is a new term, but the experience of moral injury is as ancient as war itself. In the third century, the Christian church records show that when veterans returned from war, they spent a year in penance before they could resume taking the sacrament. 
We do not know the details of how clergy engaged these veterans, but clearly they knew that war changes us and that the liturgies and scriptures of the faith could help transform searing loss and renew belonging and hope. Sadly, this is a wisdom that we lost for millennia. Michael Yandel, an Iraq war veteran, describes moral injury as the war within in an article in Christian Century in 2015. Yandel wrote, what began to erode for me in Iraq in 2004 was my perception of good and evil. What I lost was a world that makes moral sense. This is what moral injury is, he said. The winds that blow when all the laws, all the understood ways of relating to other human beings have been laid flat. I returned, like so many others, to sleepless nights and to the thoughts and memories of war. There is no moral shelter when all is laid flat. Larry Graham, in his book, Moral Injury, Healing Wounded Souls, describes the journey of facing the severity of moral injury this way. Innocence lost is not innocence regained. It is innocence mourned and moral integrity reestablished. Lament bespeaks this spiritual crisis, the rupture to veterans' earlier confidence in a moral universe and their own morality when tested by this deeply flawed universe. Lamentation also reminds us that hope is sustained in relationships. Its resilience is renewed through the witness of those who share our lives. The one lamenting seeks a witness and only then is their personhood imperiled by loss, able to find its way back toward hope. Bearing witness is clearly not for the faint of heart. Yet bearing witness also strengthens those <clears throat> who dare to step into the void <clears throat> and who do so, <clears throat> sorry, speaking to the pain of our lamenting. Jewish philosopher Emmanuel Levinas describes the searing pain we call lamentation as creating a half opening into which a witness may choose to step. Doing so, choosing to step into that void that lamentation creates, <clears throat> facing the, the abyss of despair that arises from lamentation, means that the witness is entering the pain of veterans affected by moral injury. It is not for the faint of heart. However, Levinas reminded us, it may also initiate for the witness an extraordinary journey into a deeper imagination about the power of love and hope. Remember that Levinas wrote as a Jew in the face of the atrocities of World War II, he knew something about this power of lamentation. Two brief illustrations illustrate how employing ritual practices millennia old, as well as creative rituals in response to a particular story, may help create openings for healing, restoration of moral integrity, and a reimagined self and world. One of those is familiar particularly from, um, from Catholic tradition called Lectio Divina, where one um, practices reading scriptures and reflecting on them. And we can certainly find a number of them in the Psalms, for example, where a third of the Psalms are identified as Psalms of Lament in both Jewish and Christian scriptures, obviously. Most Psalms of Lament include some response of presence of the divine, but not all. Kathleen O'Connor reminds us that second Isaiah in Jewish and Christian scriptures is also imagined as a response to the book of Lamentations. Here too, over time, reading, reflection, and conversation may provide a path toward renewed hope. A veteran might also be invited to write their own lament and to bring it to a conversation with a religious leader or a counselor. Or perhaps a veteran is, is invited to write what some call witness poetry. It may not be a formal lament, but it speaks from that veteran soul, that wounded soul, and is often shared with other veterans in a circle of mutual support. 
Or we might imagine a rabbi who finds herself accompanying a now elderly veteran entering hospice care, who finally, after decades, breaks his silence over the pain he bears from combat in the Korean War. How can we imagine how she and he might return to the prayers of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur? How they might pray the Vidui, the prayer employed prior to death among Jews, and talk about the promises it offers of God's love. Finally, I point to the wisdom of Navy Captain Chaplain Beth Stalinger, who reminds us that addressing moral injury is also important for communities of faith, themselves finding the need for rites and rituals that keep before us the fact of our own complicity, our involvement in the pain of veterans. As she reminds us, a democracy, in a democracy, warriors are deployed at the order of leaders elected by the people. She emphasizes the point that an entire country in a democracy goes to war. She urges communities of faith to develop rituals of lament and healing that name our individual and corporate trauma and grief. Imagine how empowering it might be for veterans to help shape such liturgical practices and to find sisters and brothers who are not veteran, veterans, but standing beside them, also voicing lament for the fact of the pain and destruction that war brought home to them and to many others in other lands. I'll stop here for now, but I'm looking forward to a conversation with my three colleagues. Nancy, thank you so much. Um, I invite uh, our three presenters, our three teachers to engage uh, for about the next 15 minutes in a conversation among yourselves and uh, then I'll join you. So please go ahead. Um, so I, I always talk. Um, so I, 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 somebody put up a, a post a chat room post I just saw briefly asking what this has to do with people who have not uh, are not believers in God and I, I think you've talked about the increasing abundance of young people in, in that uh, group and um, I, I think that we're talking about a process of recovery and that that doesn't require I think myself that the Book of Lamentations offers us a process that doesn't require belief in God. And in fact, we might say the voices in here no longer seem to believe much about God. Um, and that what they're seeking is what we're all talking about. And that is a witness. And as Nancy was uh, developing her thoughts about this, I was remembering uh, learning about the Yale study of the Shoah, the Holocaust, after which survivors were being interviewed and filmed. And I, I don't remember the details of it. I could find it out if anybody wanted it. But in the details, the people who were listening kept trying to turn the stories toward happy endings. Well, at least you didn't have this happen, or at least that didn't happen, or at least you've survived. And the, the effect of that kind of speech was to fail to be a witness. It was to fail to do what Nancy was inviting us to do, which is to step over into that reality and actually stand there and not reject the humanity of the um, people who've suffered moral injury. So um, that, that's my first immediate response to what you said. Right. Chris, can I respond to the question uh, for a moment? Uh, I completely agree. I appreciate the question um, that you were referencing, Kathleen. Uh, absolutely, moral injury afflicts everybody. Um, and uh, it's no respecter of whether one has um, any kind of, of religious tradition. Um, it, I, what I was trying to describe was the ways in which responders, uh, people who choose to bear witness, if they come from that tradition, can use it creatively. Right, right. But it's also the case that 
Um, uh, there's a, a terrific chapter by Sean Fawson in a book that I co-edited called Military Moral Injury and Spiritual Care, where Sean writes about uh, witness poetry. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, it's very much um, related to what Chris was describing for um, the person with whom he worked, uh, a way of trying to articulate, but the important thing is, is then to share that pain, it comes out of them and it's offered to the group. And this is um, something that Shelley Rambo also describes in veteran groups um, in, in her book, Resurrecting Wounds, that this kind of, the, the importance is of, of sharing that lament in the presence of others and um, being able to find others who can walk with you when as, as Michael Yandel writes, the world is laid flat. Um, so, um, when we post the bibliography for the, our presentations uh, with the link, hopefully folks will be able to find these of use. But that's, um, uh, you know, that's one of the ways that um, I think is important to underscore is that it, um, it you know, you don't, everyone uh, is vulnerable to lamentation. If that person has any standing in a particular tradition, then the resources of that tradition may be of use. Well, no, I really, I really appreciate uh, both of those comments. And in my experience, while the majority of the military now would not specifically ascribe to a religious tradition, it's interesting as I talk with them about issues of moral injury, because they often describe it in terms of an objective outside morality that sounds very similar to our religious traditions, mm -hmm. even if they don't specifically believe in God anymore. So in that sense, I think many of those individuals would still benefit from the process that you both have described with the lamentation, with the witness, because they conceive of the world in which there is some type of morality outside of themselves that they personally have violated, even if they no longer ascribe that morality to God. So what I found as being a Navy chaplain, where we also um, work with you know, we provide our own religious services, but oftentimes we're counseling people who have vastly different religious views than ourselves, that I can witness to their own understanding of morality without necessarily invoking religious language and then mm -hmm. allow them to process through that work of lamentation. Mm -hmm. So, um, yes, I think, uh, as you said, Nancy, it applies to um, pretty much everyone can suffer from moral injury and then that right. process of recovery can be used by all as well. Right. And I, I noticed in, in Michael Yandel's article when he talks about the laws being laid flat, that even if one doesn't have a religious tradition, one has an expectation um, at some, um, some level of human behavior, of ex um, what, what he called the laws of humanity. And um, it's interesting to me that the sociologist Nancy Ammerman, who conducted with the Templeton grant, a very extended um, research into variety of spiritualities in the United States found that the 80% of Americans, the highest percentage, um, ex embraced a spirituality that was similar to the so-called golden rule, to love your neighbor as yourself. And if that's your code, then war mm -hmm. um, is going to uh, be devastating. So whether it's a spiritual or a, a, a moral kind of um, uh, source for spirituality, um, you know, war is going to take its toll. Mm -hmm. well, I, I, think what's in, oops, I was going to say, I think what's really important, though, is that we bear witness to a morality instead of telling someone that, well, that really wasn't that bad, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. And I think Jonathan Shea writes about that very early on, that it, we can't just tell people what you did isn't that bad or we sent you there, it's okay. Right. We have to bear witness to that idea that you really do feel like you transcended deeply held moral beliefs. And I think that's where even therapies like adaptive disclosure, which is not specifically religious, are doing just that by recognizing that benevolent moral authority in order for them to come to terms with morality, instead of just trying to say, well, it's a relative morality. Well, I so wonder. I uh, I was, did, okay. Well, um, I, I wonder. I, I think a lot about what it takes to be a good witness. Mm 
And it isn't just not imposing your views on them. It seems to me it first requires the work of the chaplain or the witness or whoever we're talking about that, that one encounter one's own suffering and one owns blockages and one owns sense of vulnerability uh, as a point of connection and that it isn't simply having good thinking that's going to help the person or persons in the community. And so that's why it also seems to me, as you're both describing, it would be very helpful for a community of, uh, from which the injured person comes from and among whom that person is working because that they would be, they would be able to enter into the deep brokenness and vulnerability of the injured person, mm -hmm. morally injured person. Right. I, th I think one of the concerns that I've had related to um, the pain of moral injury for veterans during COVID, especially for older veterans, has been the isolation that COVID Im imposed. VA chaplains have told me that more veterans were coming in for a particular session because they had they, they were blocked from access to friends they might have met for coffee somewhere. And we know that um, uh, another member of the National Advisory Board to, uh, who works, who, do, who leads a veterans group mentioned to me a few days ago that the percentage of suicides, daily suicides has gone up by about a fourth um, during COVID. So the isolation, mm -hmm. the, the lack of a witness mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is deadly. Um, and, um, you know, so find, helping ways uh, to help us have ears to hear, perhaps, and the yes. courage to step in. Yes. And, 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 and to say again that the, the role of the witness is to give back the dignity to the person who's done this by not thinking they're crazy, by not seeing their suffering as a mistake or as, um, as, as a, a misapprehension of their life not talking them out of it, not talking mm -hmm. them to a happy ending, but just really right. being there. That right. That is like something so deep about human life expressed in that perception, it seems to me, mm -hmm. our connectedness, the connectedness of all of us. And we can't connect if we think we're the savior. We can't connect if we think we have the right thinking. We can't connect if we have the right strategies. We can connect if we have the right, if we have worked through our own brokenheartedness, our own mm -hmm. suffering, our own wounds, our own woundedness, and then we can receive somebody else's. Chris, I wanted to respond to um, the, the phases that you mentioned of working with the veteran in your story and, and note how well they reflect um, trauma-informed um, therapy that really began um, particularly um, I'm thinking about Judith Herman's mm -hmm. uh, famous book on trauma and recovery um, of bearing witness of remembrance and mourning and reconnecting. And so the, the wisdom of that, the, the importance of bearing witness uh, to the pain. Um, but one of the things that I makes me also value Beth Stallinger's challenge to you know, bear witness to congregants who think if or, or to the to the larger U.S. community that hasn't really paid attention to Afghanistan, uh, for example, um, is um, not only to bear witness to this uh, to this veteran uh, or the person who experienced violence, but also the importance of bearing witness, as Herman said, to the public that this violence has happened. Mm -hmm. And I, that's where I think um, communities, whether they be communities of faith or other kinds of communities that surround veterans, need to find our voices to, to bear witness to the cost of war. I wonder what you think about that. Hmm. I think that in my experience working with veterans, and in much of the literature on moral injury that we've all read, that seems to be one of the most important components of healing and also one of the most challenging to facilitate. And what I mean by that is in many ways, that's just not 
the American way, right? We like to go to war and we like to win wars and we like to celebrate things. We often don't like to bear witness to the pain and suffering that accompanies those decisions to do so. So I think that becomes a very challenging situation when I've worked with veterans, specifically asking, why did we have to go here? Why am I away from my family to go do this specific mission, this specific war? And they're looking for that exact response, Nancy, that you're bringing up. And I'm not quite sure where to point them toward. Mm -hmm. In smaller towns, that can be easier because sometimes the church or the social leader of the mayor or whoever can put together something in very small town America, but especially in our larger cities that are fleet concentration areas, it's hard to really imagine something like that. Yeah, it would take focused effort, wouldn't it? I, I've, I've really wondered since I've been directing the center about whether there would be some way, it wouldn't be something you could just, since I, uh, I am a, um, I belong to a religious community, but I'm, I'm thinking about how one could prepare a religious community. There are some who have done it, who, mm -hmm. for example, on Veterans Day might have a public lament um, of war and the toll that it takes. Because so many of us Americans, is, is especially since Vietnam, can go, can be sort of oblivious mm -hmm. to a yes. war that only, that a smaller number of us participated in. Mm -hmm. And, and it, it, does, it does seem to me important to think about the importance of what Beth was saying, Beth Stalinga, about mm -hmm. you know, naming our role in this pain. And I think that ties in actually very well to one of the questions in the chat about who starts this process of lament and witness. And I think it could be the individual service member returning. It could be a faith community. It could just be the family or friends of the individual. But whether um, it's Judith Herman's stages of trauma or some of the post-traumatic growth psychologists, it always starts, it seems to start with this idea of bearing witness and really facing that thing that's always there, but you never want to look at. Well, and I how we do that, I think, from Kathleen's presentation, she was helping give us some of those tools on how we might do that. Well, I, I want to add something here that I learned by working on the prophet Jeremiah, which is when I finally did come into trauma and disaster theory. When I was doing lamentations, I didn't have that theory. I just had hunches. But um, one of the things I learned about literature and helping people recover um, from traumatic experiences and of terrible violence is, the, as you all know, the difficulty of entering, re-entering it directly without getting re-traumatized. And so one of the functions of literature, movies, stage shows, can be to re-enter the experience of trauma and disaster and injury indirectly. In, in figures in the literature to which uh, to which something similar has happened, but it's not directly putting you back into that moment of war for it or that moment of action. And so that can have the effect of also being a kind of witness, a kind of gentle going forward. And then, of course, um, to actually claim it and and be able to move forward, at least from my perspective with the literate, the biblical literature, is that it bec becomes, again, necessary to have a larger vision, ultimately, into which you place the community or the individuals place their experience. And so that it broadens out. It isn't denied. It's simply seen in a bigger picture. Mm -hmm. That's just the story of Joseph in Genesis. You know, Joseph, Joseph is the victim. He's tortured. He's put in prison. He's put in the pit twice. He's betrayed by his whole family. And yet at the end of it, having gone through this process again and again of recovery, the, the story of Joseph is where the victim saves the people because the victim now is able to see what they've done to him mm -hmm. in a forgiving and larger way. And so I don't want to lose the importance of reading other literature and seeing films and drama where you can kind of start approaching what's happened to you without being completely submerged in your own experience. Mm -hmm. Thank, you. Yeah. Thank so, you. 
You know, um, let me, let me, I'm sorry, Nancy, do you want to say something? I wanted I'll... to add one other thing. Sorry, sure. uh, Kim. Go ahead. Part of this conversation makes me think about the work of Zachary Moon, where he's encouraging congregations, for example, not to um, put veterans in a certain box as, um, as if uh, the moral injury they've experienced is um, and utterly encompassing. But if I, but that, it, it, to my mind, he's picking up a bit about once one has really entered into that process of, of remembrance and mourning, that there's a renewed capacity for reconnecting. And Zachary Moon lifts yeah. up the skills and strengths that veterans bring from their training and their service. Uh, that, 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 and that, so the power of reconnecting and giving back to others um, is also, it seems to, has a certain energy of restoring one's sense of belonging and importance as a member of the community. That, that seems pretty clear um, in what he writes and what other veterans have described that um, the wounds of war are not eventually and with good work are not all there is to them. Right. And, 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 and that I, I don't want to lose that as we try to be attentive to the wounds yeah. themselves. Thank you. Thanks, um, Nancy. Mm -hmm. um, I have a couple of uh, questions I'd like to address to the three of you. Um, first of all, we have a number of comments in the chat about um, questions about what does healing look like mm -hmm. after bearing witness, especially if observe if sufferers have no faith. But I want to start with working within faith communities for starters, mm -hmm. right? Um, I believe it was Kathleen who mentioned with the places in the um, annual cycle of observance where lamentation um, mm -hmm. takes can take place, Tisha B'Av, the ninth mm -hmm. of Av in Judaism. Um, and you said, Kathleen, a little bit of Holy Week within the Christian mm -hmm. tradition. Yes. Um, <laughs> a little bit. Um, so I wanted to ask all three of you, um, in your faith, respective faith traditions, to think about, I mean, are there other places, for instance, in the oh, liturgy? I'm so sorry. sorry. That's the best sorry, wind sorry. sound I've ever heard. I'm trying to mute oh. myself. Okay, that's okay. Are there places in the liturgy or in the annual cycle of, of observance um, that could be um, that could be utilized for in either individual or communal lament, um, or you know how might the already existing places be used to help or extrapolated perhaps to other settings or times of the year in a creative in a creative way. Okay, interested in your in your thoughts about what might be possible, you know, to go with what we have in our respective traditions yep. and then go and then go beyond and go further creatively. Well, um, I could start us off with the observation that the uh, a lot of Christian liturgy uses, uses the book of Psalms as responses to readings at services. And um, there is, uh, Chris, I think already mentioned that one third of the Psalms are laments. And um, I think that that provides uh, liturgical leaders with every kind of opportunity um, that would be lost in local churches unless there's a lot of veterans there, it seems to me. Um, but these, these Psalms of lament sometimes um, portray all sorts of lostness and absence, and they can be re- they can be re-employed in, in sermons and in other kinds of services. So it's there. And in fact, um, my colleague, Walter Brueggemann, who's written a lot about laments and psalms, um, observed the way uh, laments hardly get uh, used or addressed. And I'm a Catholic and I thought, oh, that's not true in my church. I'm sure we do it differently. It's not, it's no different. The people, something about American culture and our systems of denial, and you know, let's have a happy ending. Let's always have a happy ending. That takes over too often, I think. Kim, I also Nancy, 
Uh, yet I also hope you'll speak uh, as a rabbi um, uh, to that same, um, to your own question. Um, yeah, I'm, go ahead. I, I'm struck um, about the, the irony that um, Shelley Rambo in her book, Resurrecting Wounds, reminded me um, of a way, well, actually she introduced me to a way of interpreting I believe it's John 21, um, or when um, the resurrected Jesus comes back uh, and uh, comes through a locked door to the terrified disciples, missing Thomas. Um, and her point, uh, she, she's um, elaborating on the fact that um, there's not been a whole lot of commentary on the fact that he comes back with gaping wounds that um, we see the, the holes from the nails and from the spear. And this says something about, um, she rightly, I think, is pointing out that this says something about not cleaning up, so to speak, um, the fact that, um, this, that he comes back demonstrating a divine presence that is mindful of the worst we can do to each other. And that is the way he chooses to be among us. So it strikes me that it's not only in texts that uh, for, for Christians Lent would be perfect, <laughs> but, but there are many other texts um, and certainly that one from John that, um, that says a good deal, it seems to me, about the pain we do to one another and certainly um, you know, the violence we can do to one another extrapolate to war. Okay. Um, thanks. Chris, did you want to respond to that? I really like what both Kathleen and Nancy have said, but just to add a little bit, I would say part of the challenges in my experience with churches is, is since they often don't know how to recognize veterans, it's normally either standing up at Veterans Day. Right. <laughs> both veterans don't want to do in my experience, or ignoring it as if it's not there. So just the invitation to veterans to start leading different things can be very powerful. I was working at one church where a few veterans got together and they actually influenced the liturgy and the sermon for a couple of weeks in order to share part of their experiences with the pastor to make it more authentic to who they were and their experiences as compared to someone just pushing a lament or pushing a recognition onto them. Mm -hmm. So an invitation rather than the pushing on can be very helpful as we all know from our pastoral sides. Great, thank you. Um, another question, um, Dr. Rachel Adler in an article entitled For These I Weep Theology of Lament says, we have not made much room for lament in our communal life. She says, it is an irony. We want to repair the world, and yet we are reluctant to acknowledge that everything is broken, including ourselves. Mm -hmm. Now, it may be obvious, but I actually would like to invite um, the three of you to talk about why haven't we made much room for lament in our communal life? I mean, exactly, what, it might be help, helpful to really think about where has been, where the reluctance or the resistance has been to actually doing this work? Maybe I'll jump in really quick at the beginning, just in terms of military culture. If I don't think we have a lot of room for that because I don't think we ever want to lose. The American military was built on winning, like we said, and in doing so, lamenting of loss could possibly mean failure, which could mean failure of leadership, failure of a mission, just uh. failure in general. Now it's true, we are very good at doing ritual ceremonies in terms of memorials when people pass away or are killed. But even those, when you look at them, while they're very powerful events are also their own shows in some way where we practice the drill, we practice the ceremony, we make sure that the uniforms are right. So often they themselves can see more of a success as in we can even memorialize dead really well, rather than a lament of what happened to this individual and what were they a part of and should they even have been a part of it. 
So I think that can be a challenge starting with the military culture and moving out to our broader society that lamenting really kind of means that something really bad happened and wrong. And I'm not sure if we always want to go there in the military that's always right and always wins. Yeah, and, and added to that, I think, is the sense that we that if, if you're lamenting and complaining and whining, you're just a weakling. You just need to pull yourself up by your bootstraps if you have them and get on with it. And and that's to me as a form of also related to the whole thing of consumerism and denial and we need the best life and let's just keep plunging ahead. So um, I just want to add that to what Chris has already said so well. Yeah, to honor is different than to lament. We like to honor things in the military. We don't really uh, like to lament yeah. things in the military. I, I'll jump in. I, I think um, I, I, there's a fine article by Larry Graham in the journal Pastoral Theology uh, about public lament. And, I'm, and, and he mentions then, for example, the Vietnam Wall mm -hmm. and uh, the power it still has for many. Um, that go there and stand there and try to absorb 55,000 deaths, I think it was. Um, and I also overhear lament from many persons who, for example, have been to Montgomery to what I oh, informally yes. call the lynching museum. Um, and the power, the lynching memorial, and the power that it has to pierce white privilege uh, and the resistance to naming the horror of slavery. Um, so I, I think we've underestimated, um, I, I hope that I, this is not only, one can also think about public leaders, um, presidents, for example, that might take advantage of uh, a public's position to um, articulate lament. Uh, in a way that uh, we saw recently about um, the virus mm -hmm. uh, as Biden was about to come into office. Um, and so I, I do think that there's a public dimension to, of it that when it's done well, we see a real response by the American people. Mm -hmm. So I, I think the need for lament um, that, 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 uh, what pierces if, uh, that need to be positive um, I, in our culture. Um, the, clearly there's a hunger um, uh, when, it, when it's done effectively. And I, I would, um, I, I think that uh, the whole, um, you know, we've certainly had um, uh, pain and, and, and riots and so forth, understandably related to violence. Of police violence, for example, um, I think there is a longing also for for lament um, of this grievous um, aspect of our history, and I do think lament has a role in opening a door mm -hmm. for a different mm -hmm. future. Mm -hmm. So I hope religious leaders uh, and public leaders will be attentive to that. I, I think one other thing I would say is I remember, I think who of us can forget when Obama began to sing Amazing Grace right. after the Mother Emanuel slaughter. Um, that was lament. We all wanted, most of us wanted to lament. Um, well, one, thing, yeah. one thing maybe I could jump in real quick for a little context is I actually, thinking about it more, a lot of Marines and sailors will lament to each other in private in terms of in small groups, the hardships they've gone through, but that lament rarely goes up through the chain of command more publicly. So it becomes private small laments, whereas a more public showing could probably be better for healing as both of you have pointed out. And I think that's another challenge we see. Well, I, I have one last question here and I, I can't answer it at all. Well, do you think that there is underneath the fear to lament and the fear to point things out, the fear of shame. We don't want to be shamed. And we're shamed in our culture if we're not strong, if we're not powerful. It's just a question I have, but somebody asked was asking about the roots of it. I wonder if that's one of the wells at the bottom of it. We don't want to be shamed. And if we admit what we've gone through and how broken we are, that is shaming. 
Actually, one of the questions in the chat, um, I think relates to this. Someone said, describe Black Lives Matter as a group could be considered, could be understood as a group lament. Um, with the oh, yes. um, with the pushback, an example of not wanting to go there or hear that, and I'm going to just add to this, perhaps out of a resistance to acknowledging one's own complicity, having to look at one's own racism. And here, Nancy, I'm remembering the teachings of Dr. Dale Andrews of Blessed Memory, who taught a lot about the resistance of people to look at their racism because of the moral injury that would cause them. Right, right, right. <clears throat> right. Um, okay. Other thoughts about this? No, no. that's great. No, I think that's well put. Yeah, okay. Um, a question in general, because I think a, a number of people are wondering, what does healing look like after bearing witness and lamenting if the sufferer has no faith? Um, and I want to give the three of you another opportunity to address that, although you have you, you have in various ways. But I think particularly perhaps for a younger generation of veterans who may not come from established um, faith traditions, um, uh, what are the what are the resources that can be brought to bear for them? Chris, I'm hoping you'll start. <laughs> No, absolutely. I, I think that after the initial lament and bearing witness, one thing that does is it leads to hope and connection because it tells us there's some hope that we can get through this because we're now connecting with others, whether it's horizontally, the unit, the person, the unit I'm working with, family, spouse, or maybe beyond ourselves to something that is greater or divine. So I think that lament itself can begin those phases, as we said, of trauma recovery or post-traumatic growth or whatever phases we might ascribe to, to move us forward. But I think we actually will continuously come back to lament through the healing process as well. Because as we're starting to heal and reflect on those experiences that are so challenging, we see them in new lights and we lament or grieve different aspects of them at different times. And I think that's important to keep in mind. I was working with one individual who it seemed like every couple of weeks he would come back and look back at the exact same, the morally traumatic event from a little different view and lament a different part of it. And that actually became part of his healing process itself was seeing it through a different lens and realizing the loss here and then bearing witness to a slightly different part of that moral trauma. Oh, wow. um, yeah, actually, Chris, can I just jump in with something there? Yes. Because while, Kath, while Kathleen was doing her presentation, I was thinking about a, a possibly an interesting and creative and non-religious way of using lamentations um, for those who don't identify with any particular faith community. And that was when, Kathleen, you were talking about the voices in the book, mm -hmm. the woman Zion, the narrator, the God mm -hmm. there and the community. And I could imagine um, working with someone to share those voices as, lit as literature, mm -hmm. for instance, with someone who was suffering, take it out of the, relig the religious context, if you will, if that might be off-putting to someone, but almost as, um, as, a, as a drama, for instance. Perfect. Uh, here are characters. And can you identify with any of them? Do any of them speak to you and your experience, for instance? A hundred percent. And I think that's actually very effective to use because while many of our young service members don't want to be converted to a specific religion, they often very much appreciate voices from religious traditions as guides. So I think that could work very well. I also know that, um, you know, from conversations I've had with various VA chaplains, that there's some programs that use um, what I would call witness poetry. Mm -hmm. So they, the person might write a lament that's not a religiously grounded, um, but writes a poem that um, articulates her or his grief um, and shares it so that it, it's, it's getting it out and sharing it in a group that is safe enough 
um, and then finding the support in that group that is part of finding the strength to re-enter with a sense of um, uh, um, what Larry Graham calls moral integrity reestablished. Wow. That, to my mind, Graham named it well, that, that finally it's that, uh, I, I think about the story of Jacob uh, wrestling. He was quite a scoundrel um, and faced what he thought might be his death. Um, and he wrestles with whom he thinks is God. But the question um, might be, was it God waiting for him to ask for a blessing? Or was it Jacob wrestling for a blessing? What he got was a new name and walking with a limp. And it, and it strikes me that for many veterans, that might be it, it, a new sense of themselves, mm -hmm. a recovered sufficient moral integrity, but there'll always be a limp, um, at least metaphorically, uh, from facing that, to my mind, from facing that kind of uh, harm. And yet, um, you know, we find veterans groups where these folks are making enormous contributions in their community. So the kind of strength that is built in military life and commitment to one another can be converted uh, into commitments uh, for, um, you know, visiting folks that are confined uh, uh, and caring for young kids and helping them to find community when they don't have it. So I, I don't think it has to, that the healing needs to take a religious uh, shape at all but a, a sense of moral integrity, a recovering sufficient to re-enter with a sense that you have something to give. Um, you're using the language of moral integrity and I think it's exactly right, but I, I would use something much vaguer. I would be, as a consequence of tr reading trauma theory, and et cetera. Um, I, I think that the person who's, that we're talking about has been traumatized and they have experienced horrible violence and they have a sense of agency in that violence and they are also victims in that violence. And so how can they actually deal with that and go forward? And what I think we're looking for is moving out of the benumbed, isolated state, as you've said, to a kind of thriving. And, and, and I want to see thriving, human thriving, instead of the way violence represses, suppresses, numbs, takes away language. And so this whole process we're talking about it is, um, is about finding, at least in part, finding some way of seeing what's happened to you, what you've experienced, being honored in that, or at least recognized in that. And in a long, horrible, broken, limping process, moving toward some new kind of wholeness. And for me, it doesn't have to have a particular moral quality to it, but I guess it would if we're reconnecting with human beings. That's That would be broad enough language for me then. Um, that's that's all because I haven't been using this language of moral injury. Consider me the outlier here. There are certainly a number of veterans groups um, for whom that journey is um, that you describe would be to be to be making significant contributions to the well-being of their community, to kids in that community, yes. to you know habitat, whatever. Um, so using the skills that they had um, with a renewed sense of we have something to give. Yes, we're important here. Something to live for. Yeah. One of the uh, questioners in the chat mentions an EMT. Um, experiencing um, uh, the, the chat writer said horrid experiences. Could this be considered moral injury? Um, I want to invite uh, <laughs> uh, Chris, for instance, Nancy, Kathleen, any of you to respond to that question? Uh, yes, I think all, <laughs> I guess. Uh, uh, yes, we're all nodding. Um, so what's interesting in some of the literature is that a medical professional, either in the military or outside, definitely experience morally challenging events that may transcend their deeply held moral values, as someone like Litz would define it. What I also find interesting, though, is many times the medical professionals I've worked with tend to recover better when they face it. 
because of an overarching belief that what they're doing is hopefully good, even if the specific acts along the way may not have worked out the way they wanted to. So for instance, the medic in the wartime may say, well, I didn't believe in the war. I didn't like what our unit did. I didn't like what I did, but at least I was trying to help people, which can be a slight difference from some, say, infantry men or women who said, wow, my whole purpose was to destroy things. So well, I'd say, yes, anyone can experience moral injury, military or not military, but how they've experienced will, will obviously tailor the response in order to help them in their process of healing. Kim, I, 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 I agree with what Chris has said. I also want to add that over um, several months, a number of months, uh, certainly in the fall and winter, um, a number of us that talk about moral injury were also invited to talk with hospital staff um, and to, um, to offer tools related to lamentation and, uh, and moral injury. Um, these are folks that, you know, no matter what tools they had, they didn't have enough and they didn't know how to fix this. Um, but many of them who signed up to be a doctor or a nurse uh, found themselves also being the priest. Uh, you know, to one death after another. Um, and so the, the lamentation and uh, real lamentation in the face of an, uh, something, a, a beast they couldn't, they couldn't overcome. It was, um, uh, it has been a long, hard slog um, and, a, and a sense of moral injury because they, you know, they, they couldn't uh, overcome it. Um, well, I was thinking what would happen if I ran over somebody in an automobile, I would have moral injury so profound, I don't know if I could live, honestly. Yeah. So then when I put myself in, in the context of warfare, it becomes unimaginable, ungraspable, really. Uh, yeah, I think that the our, all of our experience of the past year uh, plus in the time of COVID has added um, mm -hmm. a whole additional layer um, and dimension, you know, Nancy, you mentioned specifically COVID restrictions leading to isolation, um, making people who were already psychologically isolated, the physical isolation simply compounding the, the emotional and psychological mm -hmm. um, isolation. So the, I, I think we are only now beginning to understand what this past year has done to us in terms of moral injury and we'll continue to, I mean, we're still in it now, we're not out of it yet. Right. So I think it will be very interesting to add to our learning as we go forward yes. out, God willing, out of this year to be able to look back and see what we learned from the particular, this particular right. um, trauma. Let me, um, there was a question in the chat. This is a very big question, but I, I don't wanna miss it. Um, and somebody said regarding the absence of God's voice in lamentation, well, where is God then? For, yeah. for the oh, suffering. Kathleen, I'm so glad you're here. Go for it. <laughs> I have to go now. I'm sorry, I'm busy. Ah. Um, uh, actually, uh, uh, that's a really good question. And, and the way one would approach that is the way one thinks about biblical texts. So biblical texts from some perspectives are the literal divine word of God coming down to us. That's not the way critical scholars or many faith leaders approach biblical texts. Rather, the biblical texts are expressions of human experiences, plural, of the divine. And so if I take that as I do as my starting point in, in studying biblical texts, then I see lamentations as expressions of human experience of the search for God. And that's why I think if God comes in, then everybody's going to go right to the whatever God says and all these other voices, the specifics, the, the gritty hardness of this imagery will be kind of absorbed into whatever God says. So that's a, a very open understanding of what the Hebrew texts are. So not any one of them, and not, or the New Testament either, not any one of them gives us a thoroughgoing identification of God, because God can't be thoroughgoingly identified. Identified. <laughs> thank, thank you so much. Um, before I turn this back to Nancy for a few 
closing words, I want to just offer this. Um, in the discussion of lamentations as an acrostic, and in the acrostics that, um, for instance, within um, Jewish literature, we, we see any number of use in the liturgy and elsewhere, use of acrostics. I want to share with you a teaching from one of my teachers, Dr. Michael Chernick, um, who once said, do you know why some um, prayers are listed A to Z as an acrostic? He said to teach that suffering ends. Hmm. That there's an, all right? You that go suffering ends, A. right. It's contained. You yes. A to Z and there can be an ending to it. And that the acrostic is a reminder. Lovely. That it can end. So I just wanted to, I wanted to share that with you. Um, Nancy? That's, no, that's, thank you. That was a, a, a really helpful way to bring this to a close. And I really appreciate your moderating this very much, Kim. I also want to express thanks to Kathleen and to Chris, um, to Kyle and to Sam McAllister. Um, and thank you all for the thank chat. Um, and uh, so Kathleen or, or Chris, if there's anything you want to say to the audience, it's, now's the time. Well, um, I hope that there's a way I can receive what was written on the chat. I didn't put the chat up on my side because I wanted to be able to listen. So, so I missed a lot of what was going on there, and I would love to see the, the comments and questions. And um, I'm honored to have been asked, dragged into this by Nancy. And <laughs> it was a pleasure to be with Chris and Kim and Kyle and Sam. <laughs> no, uh, thank you to you all. I wanted to lift up, there was one more thing in the chat referencing lament with family and how we've talked so much about service members, but it's the parents, the husbands, the wives, the children of service members who also oh. go through a communal lament as well as their service members deployed or as moral injury affects and goes out through family. So another area of further conversation, we even lament within family systems. Absolutely. And, 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 and for us to, if we're, where there are uh, faith communities to structure support for families yeah. uh, is very uh, important. Um, As that, thank you to you all for inviting thank me. Thank you, well. Chris. Thank you, everybody, and uh, hope to see you on May 25th. We'll we'll move on from lament to forgiveness. So uh, we'll we'll wrap this all up. <laughs> thank A you to all. See. A to Z. Yeah. <laughs>